we talk, we work, we walk together. That's very important. And um, I can see a, see friends from all around the world, from US, Canada, Europe. Um, you can see someone from Middle East, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, from everywhere. So welcome to this uh, Business Summit, uh, Investor Summit uh, monthly webinar. And uh, we'll have a, a wonderful, we'll have an wonderful um, speaker, one of the most uh, uh, meritorious and, uh, and uh, intelligent uh, personality who has been contributing um, to the business and uh, education economies in the world. Dr. Samir Asaf, he is a senior partner at the Reason Financial, one of the boutique best possible investment banker in the US. Dr. Asaf has a colorful background with his um, education from all around the world, studied in many universities, schools, which are top rated ones in the world, including um, Harvard, including um, um, is um, also the teacher in, is uh, a professor in Stanford, um, London School of Economics, he used to study as well, and did his PhD from Switzerland. Well, and worked uh, over 30 years in top corporate organizations that are um, world's largest organizations, including AT&T. He was the director of finance of AT&T Global, which is the largest telecom companies in the world. And he was also with a uh, few, many other um, companies. Right now, he's in business and he's uh, a professional. So we will be, we, we have been facing a caution, you know, from many friends that um, why we need an investment banker and how they help us. What do they do? So this question, I have been talking to Dr. Samir and uh, I can see there is a need. Even to me, I needed this answer for me as well, that what role an investment banker plays and why we need them. And when I see in, you know, I saw in last few years, the, what the investment bankers are doing, I can see a massive amount of work they do and massive volume of process they follow. And then to me, it become a, like a, the role of a lawyer, like you are going to fight a case in the court, the best possible lawyer you have, the chances of winning the case you have more and more. So that's where basically in investment bankers, you know, bankers start the role. So the better, the best possible investment banker you have, they prepare your documents like a lawyer will prepare. They will prepare all the best possible arguments in your favor. They will prepare your as a client to face the investor, to face the business owners and prepare all the questions that may come up, all the information that will be needed to be presented. We cannot just go to a court and say, here is my document, uh, uh, honorable court, here is something that I want to say. No, you can't say that. Your lawyer has to say that. If you want to even submit some documents, your lawyer has to do that, right? Similarly here, if you are looking for an investor and an investment banker is helping you, 
to get you the funding, it has to be a class one who has knowledge, who has the voice, who has the capability, who has the courage, and who understands your business, who will understand your case and prepare it accordingly what the investors are looking for. So similarly, um, similar to the um, court situation, as I say, here is the role of an investment banker. I'm sure Dr. Samir Asab will be talking more on this and show you how an investment banker really help you make your life easier and get you the money needed for you to run your business, to expand your business, to harvest better revenue, better profitability, and run a business very successfully. So this is what we are going to talk today. And I will be presenting very shortly um, Dr. Samir Asaf. I hope he's here. Dr. Asaf, if you can kindly unmute and um, and unwind and uh, and start your presentation will be very glad welcome dr samir Asaf. <clears throat> thank you thank you dr hadir zaman and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, i need to share my screen so uh, just allow me to share my screen and just to make sure that you all can see just let me know. Um, just want to make sure. Is there anybody who cannot see the screen? Everybody can see the screen. Good. We can see. Yeah. So, yeah. We can see. So, anyway, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> very generous introduction, uh, very kind um, introduction by, by my brother, uh, Dr. Hadir Zawan. Um, and um, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you today. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. Uh, my goal today is really to take about 20 minutes to make a presentation to all of you. I have about 10 slides, uh, basic um, information about investment banking. And uh, I am an investment banker. I'm licensed uh, by the United States Securities and Exchange Commission and FINRA. And uh, yes, I've been in finance and investment banking for over 30 years. Uh, I've taught finance at the Harvard Business School at Stanford, where I'm an adjunct professor. And yes, you know, I'm a, I'm a chartered accountant. I have a PhD in finance, uh, lots of learning throughout the years. And I'd love to, uh, I mean, I'd love to share all of my knowledge and experience with all of you. Um, I'm still a student of finance, still learning. and. Uh, uh, you know, as the world of finance changes with, um, you know, distributed uh, finance and embedded finance and, and uh, you know, uh, AI driven techniques and, uh, you know, sort of fintech affecting our industry, there's just a lot to cover. But let's start with the basics. And, and you know, I don't assume, uh, you know, any uh, level of knowledge, uh, let's start with the basics and talk about investment banking. 20 minutes, 10 slides. And then I'll open it up for Q&A and we can just have a open discussion. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to stop me. This is completely informal. And, um, you know, let's just, uh, uh, let's just go with, uh, go with the flow. Okay. All right. So what I planned for today was, um, We'll start with, um, you know, just what is investment banking. If, yeah, there's some level of confusion about this, um, as Dr. Haider Zaman mentioned. So I, I'd like to highlight that a little bit. And then uh, what is the role of investment bankers? I think that's what I was asked to, uh, to prepare for you all. So, yeah, what is our role? What do we do? Uh, and then I want to give you a flavor of, of the capital market, the debt market, the equity market. Many of you... Uh, are trying to raise or would like to raise capital. And and so we'll talk about capital market sizing uh, around the world. And then, as Dr. Hadouzaman mentioned, you know, there are a lot of regulations. We have to follow a lot of processes. And quite rightly, um, raising capital is not uh, the wild, wild west. Uh, there are very, very serious regulations 
in the United States and in Europe, and certainly in 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 almost all of the countries around the world where there is a, there is a formal capital market um, regulated by the SEC, respective SECs, and on the on the money market side, um, on the banking side, obviously. Uh, uh, managed by and governed by these respective central banks. So I will give you uh, the U.S. perspective primarily because that's where we operate. Although our investor network is a global network, but uh, we are subject to the FINRA, that is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. I'll talk about that a little bit, uh, SEC and state regulation. Then I'll jump into kind of what are the products and services that we have? And without making it uh, too complicated, I'll try to stick to the basics. And and then, you know, where do we add value? I think that's interesting because as Dr. Hadouzaman mentioned, where where do we add value? And we charge, we charge a, a lot of fees, um, you know, where do we add value? And then, you know, due diligence, what is that? How do we do it? How much time does it take? What does it include? You'll uh, cover that a little bit. And then capital raise, MA, trading, research, and advisory. We'll touch on some of these, some of these functional aspects of investment banks. And then uh, how do we help our clients, uh, especially on the re- you know, on the receiver side and the the uh, investor side, uh, maximize returns. So we'll talk about that as well. And then uh, uh, trends, what's going on in the industry. Uh, uh, this is, you take a global perspective, we take a US perspective, and we'll just touch on some of the trends and give you a flavor for the dynamics of our industry. So, yep, it's only 10 slides, but we'll be covering a lot of stuff. Uh, let's get started. And, um, you know, like I said, feel free to uh, feel free to stop me as, as needed. Okay, so just before I start, is is there any question, any anybody? Is there? Do you have any questions for me before we start? Feel free to uh, ask. Okay, all right, good. Um, so, what is investment banking? Just very simply, we are part of the financial services industry, right? And we help companies, we help governments raise capital, and. Uh, companies in the private sector as well as governments they they need capital to grow to implement big projects so when you need large scale financing you will need help from investment bankers right because why because we help you issue the securities uh, the stocks the bonds if you're um, you know, if you're looking to raise, say, anything north of hundred million dollars, you are well advised to hire an investment banker. And our job is to, you know, uh, help you plan it. We will help you uh, minimize your costs. We'll help you raise it in the best way possible, in the quickest way possible. And um, and thereby maximize your returns, maximize your shareholder value. So that's our mandate is really to serve our clients' um, best interest. Okay, there is in fact a regulation called uh, uh, called uh, customer best interest um, in America. So we are subject to uh, those regulations. Okay. Now, the other thing that we do as part of raising capital for our clients is obviously advisory services, right? As I mentioned, if you want to raise capital, why are you trying to raise that capital? Let's let's first try to understand. And maybe you say, hey, I want to expand my capacity. I have an existing operation. I want to double my capacity. Then we are going to do a lot of analysis for you and tell you what's the best way to raise that capital, right? Debt, equity, a mix of debt or equity. If you want to acquire a company, acquisitive growth. Uh, I don't know if whether you all know this, but you know, the Fortune 500 companies, uh, these are the largest companies in the world, right? And if you look at the last, say around 
20 years of performance of the Fortune 500 companies, you'll find that 90%, all right, 90% of their growth, quote unquote, came from acquisitions, not organic growth. Isn't that interesting? And, and that's, in a way, if, if you deeply think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Because these Fortune 500 companies are not, they're not startups, right? They're not in the, they're not necessarily in the sort of exponential growth stage. They are in the mature stage. They are big companies. They're paying a lot of dividends. They are essentially value stocks and uh, not growth stocks, typically. Now, there are exceptions, but uh, these companies uh, are big and um, they are certainly um, growing through acquisitions. So think about your company's growth and with, you know, organic growth versus acquisitive growth. Both are there, both are important. But as you grow very fast, you will not be able to keep growing that fast, right? So it's, it, there's, a, there's a level of uh, 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 maturity. Um, and you, as your company matures, you know, the growth rates decline and it kind of tapers off, right? So the S curve kind of tapers off. Uh, and that's where you need to innovate to keep the growth going. And then you acquire companies, you can acquire competitors and so on to grow. So that's part of the MA, part of uh, the advisory services, as well as the transaction, uh, efficient transaction execution for MA. That is part of what we do. And then complex financial transactions. So there's there can be a lot of nuances uh, in any of these transactions where you de definitely need to um, optimize for the best returns. So that's that's what we do. What we don't do is what uh, largely is done by commercial banks. That is short-term credit lines, um, you know, day-to-day -day transaction processing, treasury management, that kind of stuff we don't do. We, we are all about capex we are really not about opex right we are not going to arrange working capital financing although regent does uh, arrange working capital to our partner uh, bankers um, for our clients but uh, essentially investment banking is really long term um, you issue uh, think about think about issuing a bond right that's a security think about issuing new shares that's a security right but if you want to um, get a working capital financing, you're not issuing a bond. It's it's debt. It's a liability on your balance sheet, but it's not bond issuance. So it's not securities issuance. As long as it's not a security issuance, we are typically not going to be operating there. That's the uh, gambit of uh, commercial bankers. All right, let's take a look at our role uh, we, as I said, we help you raise capital. Okay, that's pretty clear. Uh, we help you with M&A, right? Uh, we'll help you acquire, we'll help you divest. In the process of M&A, you're buying or selling businesses or divisions, we'll help you do a due diligence. Uh, we are an independent third party. We'll help you negotiate deals and we'll help you maximize value. So uh, in the case where you're trying to acquire a company, we'll try to help you acquire it at the minimum possible cost. In the case where you're trying to raise capital, we'll try to help you minimize the dilution, all right? Now, uh, investment bankers also do trading. They, they would typically have their own proprietary trading division. Now, a region doesn't do that, but uh, there are a lot of investment banks that would do trading. Uh, trading in stocks and bonds, futures, options, FX, uh, you know, all kinds of instruments, uh, derivatives as well. And they would uh, trade on their own account as well as on, uh, on the, for the account of their clients, on behalf of their clients. So uh, that's the trading division. Then there is typically a, a research division. Uh, you know, you have analysts, investment banks have analysts and they track industries. They have analysts that have significant experience in tracking certain industries and they would issue buy, hold or sell uh, ratings or, or recommendations uh, based on that. Those can move markets, those can move investor opinion and so on. So economic research, 
by the research departments of investment banks. And then they have uh, they have advisory services, as I said, all kinds of advisory services, in particular related to strategic advice. We uh, we are not necessarily uh, like a BCG or a McKinsey that or a Bain that would come in and and do strategy consulting. What you should and shouldn't do. That's not what we do. Our our strategy advisory services is related to finance, right? So you you have to figure out what your company's strategy, right? We'll help you raise the capital to implement the strategy, and you know if you need to acquire, we'll help you with that. We'll help you restructure if you're in a uh, if you're in a distressed situation or you want to uh, manage your risk. Uh, we'll help you uh, with those. But yeah, our advisory services are mostly um, value added on on. But it has it, it always has this sort of financial aspect to our 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 advisory services, right? All right. So lots of things. We help you raise capital. We help you do M and A. We help with trading, we help with research, we help with advisory services, and then sort of bespoke services. So, you know, whatever is it is that you want to do, um, there's always uh, there's always a financial bent to it. So we work with boards, we work work with CFOs, CEOs, uh, top management, and um, uh, we help with all this uh, all, all the capital raise uh, aspects of it. Okay. So let's let's kind of switch gear a little bit, and I want to give you a sense for the for how big is the global uh, capital market, right? So I want I want you to take a look at this. So we we have USA, we have Europe, we have Asia, we have Africa, and we have total global. All right. So you see this big number, ninety three. Some say it's a hundred. Some say it's ninety five. Um, but you know, uh, let's say ninety three. Trillion dollars is roughly the size of the global capital market. So, ninety-three, ninety-five, hundred, depending on how you measure it. But yeah, it's about ninety-three to hundred trillion dollars. Huge, isn't it? Uh, it's a big market. And then you see that the United States comprises half of it, right? About half of it. And uh, Europe is about a quarter. Asia is about a quarter. And Africa is pretty much non-existent, and so what that tells us is, of course, a key takeaway is the U.S. is dominant in the global capital market, right? And then Europe and Asia are about the same size, and then Africa is extremely, extremely um, underdeveloped in terms of uh, capital market. And so, in one sense, you can say. That there is huge opportunity for growth of capital market in in Africa, and then um, uh, of course uh, the U.S. dominates. And, and and one of the other takeaways is that for those of you that are in the that are intending to raise capital, you need to see this and realize that the source of capital. Right, we we are connected to over forty five thousand institutional investors. Uh, and there's just so much capital available. Um, all right, there's a lot of capital available, and the U.S. United States uh, is uh, going to be a massive source of capital for you guys. Okay. Now let's let's take a look at the debt market versus the equity market, which is the two, which are the two major subsets of the capital market. So, just in general terms. Just take a look at the number. the The uh, debt market is bigger, much bigger than the equity market, and that that's interesting. Uh, a lot of people would think that you know the stock market is bigger than the bond market. No, it's not, right? So, it's a debt market is bigger than the equity market, and and the numbers again are very similar uh, to the the distribution. Essentially, is pretty similar to what we discussed before. Uh, but um, here you can see the U.S. is even more dominant on the debt side, right? Thirty trillion out of fifty-five trillion is from the U.S., so that's over sixty percent uh, market share in the debt market. And one of the reasons is that the debt market is um, is uh, fairly efficient in the United States. 
um, as you know, the European market and the U.S. market is is extremely different in terms of the um, in terms in terms of the sort of the financial uh, disintermediation. Right. So in Europe, as uh, as you know, uh, the banking sector provides significant amount of corporate finance, whereas in the U.S., the banking sector does not provide uh, as much uh, financing. So the capital market provides uh, provides. So there's a lot of disintermediation in the U.S. and a lot of a lot of pundits and experts and and um, and I happen to be in that group uh, would say that the United States is the most sophisticated financial market in the world. All right. So again, uh, the same trends we can see here: Africa being very small, uh, Europe slightly bigger than Asia, but then you know US is is double the size of Europe. And then equity market, uh, you know, this is uh, again similar. So interesting to me, I would say. Uh, the key takeaway would be again the U.S. is the major market, Africa extremely small, okay, and the debt market is bigger than the equity market across all the regions. So when you try to raise capital, where are you going to raise the capital from? Um, yeah, U.S. U.S. is typically the largest. All right. Let's take a look at how uh, we help. So region financial, we are we are a boutique investment bank. We have a lot of different methodologies we use uh, to maximize or help maximize your risk adjusted returns. So your risk and return are uh, positively correlated. As you know, um, the higher the risk you take, the higher the returns you can make. But um, we don't want you to take a very high risk because uh, given the returns, that is, uh, and therefore, your risk adjusted return should remain fairly high. Uh, otherwise, you're taking too much risk. So how do we do that? How do we help you? Uh, how do we help our clients? First, um, it's, it's, the, it's rigorous financial analysis and due diligence so that we, um, we, when we bring in investors, uh, we want to make sure that we've done our homework very, very thoroughly so that we have a full story for the investors right we investors don't like surprises and so the the better the analysis the better the due diligence uh the better uh and the easier it is to raise the capital active portfolio management uh, this is another aspect of uh you know sort of uh, those of you who are into sort of uh you know active investment uh buying and selling um uh, you know you you can always uh uh, optimize your risk exposure. You can achieve your desired returns if you're always on top of the game, tracking the markets and uh, following the trends. So, uh, you know, we help our clients uh, manage their portfolios uh, to some extent based on uh, our capabilities uh, of, of market analysis and recommendations. Uh, ESG, you all know, that's that's a big thing these days in the investments um investment space, right? Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, investors that are um, focusing on, and this is probably one of the major trends going forward as well, that is the ESG in the investment decision-making process. So um, there, are, there are a lot of investors who will not, in fact, invest in your company if you're not environmentally compliant, if, you're, if your social and governance aspects are not sort of uh, best in class. So we will often advise our clients to follow best practices in ESG. We, uh, you know, as I mentioned, rigorous financial analysis, part of that is sort of financial modeling. It's all the quantitative analysis. And so when we take on a client, we are certainly going to create a financial model we will do your valuation. We will do the financial analysis, credit analysis, and one of the um, one of the more sophisticated things that we do that very few investment banks uh, in the world do is real options analysis. I don't know uh, if you all have uh, have experience with this, but this is the next frontier for um, accurate valuations. So, uh, uh, you know, real options essentially are managerial options. All right, these are not these are not uh, 
you know, uh, you know, financial derivatives uh, options like call options and put options and such. Uh, this is all about your ability to expand your company's capacity over the next 10 years or contract the capacity or abandon the project. You do have these options. So real options analysis will effectively value your managerial option to expand or contract your capacity. So again, let me touch a little bit deeper here because I do want you to you guys to to understand a little bit deeper about this real options analysis. So, you know, you know about the NPV analysis, right? Any project you do, what you would what you would do is you would project your revenues, you would project over the next 10 years. This is the revenue we expect from the project. These are the expenses. And so therefore this is the cash flow from this project. It could be an expansion project, it could be a greenfield project doesn't matter what project it is, you will have a projected cash flow, right? That you would expect to receive from, uh, let's say this project. Now, what, what your finance team will do is do a net present value calculation based on some discount rate that they've come up with. And uh, you come up with a number that says your NPV is X million dollars. If your NPV is negative, then you don't do the project. Right. Because then the whole idea is, you know, you're investing the uh, 50 million dollars in the project, but the present value of the future cash flows is less than 50 million. And therefore, you have a negative NPV. And, and that basically means that this particular project is not going to add economic value to your firm. It's going to destroy shareholder value. So your, your CFO will not approve this project. So negative NPV projects, we don't do. Now, what we are left with are positive NPV projects. So, you know, you, you come up with those projects that are giving you present value of future cash flows that are higher than the initial investment you will make. And so you have positive NPV projects, you accept those projects. Now, here's, I have a question for you guys. The projected cash flows that you have estimated, right? They are future cash flows, next five years, 10 years, whatever it is. This set of cash flows that you have estimated for next 10 years, are they going to be exactly the way you have forecasted them? How, how many of you feel that your projected cash flow over the next 10 years for this project are going to be pretty much exactly, uh, you know, highly confident. These exactly are going to be the cash flows for the next 10 years. Can any of you tell me that you are supremely confident that those are the cash flows that you will have next 10 years? It won't be any, there won't be any change. Your management strategies won't change. Your future economic environment won't change. Your projected cash flows, therefore, would be no new competitors would come in. Your pricing would be exactly the same as you have planned today. The industry is static. Your, uh, you know, no, guys, no, it, that's not the way the world works. The way the world works is you implement the project and then within a year or two, things change. Things change. It's a, whether it's a it's a macro issue, whether it's your own internal strategy, whether whatever it is, things are going to change and you will probably make a few decisions as the as the decision maker, right? Whether you, you know, maybe you got a new competitor coming in and in order to, you know, you realize that you will need you will need to reduce your capacity or increase your capacity. That's the reality, my friends. Your forecasted cash flows are not static. They are dynamic. And that fact is extremely powerful because I'm sure all of you agree with me that the forecasted cash flows are not going to be exactly the way you have forecasted them. Things are going to change and you will uh, therefore be dynamic and you will respond as needed. Right. So 
that brings me to the point of real options analysis because what real options analysis posits is that the environment is going to be dynamic and you will therefore either expand your capacity or contract your capacity and therefore the future projected cash flows are actually going to end up being different than what you have projected them to be now if they are different how different are they going to be and what is going to be the impact on your npv if they are different hmm that's a very very difficult question to answer and i can guarantee you none of you can answer that question because you don't know how will you answer something that is likely to happen 7 years from now we, we no no nobody has that answer so what the real options analysis does is it says look there are probabilities all right the reality is that things are most likely going to change that is a matter of probability if we use a sophisticated technique that is used in real options analysis called the binomial lattice the multinomial lattice framework so what we do is we say look you may expand your capacity is that right you say yeah i don't know if i will or not but i may given the environment given the economic condition given the industry situation i i may expand further based on what i have uh, on 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 the books i may expand further i may not i don't know but the fact that you may expand your capacity that's a fact and you may indeed expand that has value my friends that has a tangible value and our binomial lattice and multinomial lattice framework gives us actually a dollar figure that represents that value like the black scholes model gives you a dollar figure which is the value of a put option or a call option all right so this would be added to your npv that value we will do that valuation as part of our valuation of this project and we will add that value to your npv and that is called the expanded npv okay so that's just an example and fully endorsed by harvard business school this technique has come on several harvard business review articles why the existing npv framework undervalues your project and undervalues your company because they do not incorporate the value of managerial flexibility that is the expansion option and the contraction option that i talked about so interesting isn't it that uh the modern finance will will actually give you a valuation of your company and your project which is higher than what traditional finance would have given you okay all right let's move on um, if you have any question please stop me but i'm assuming you're on board with what i said uh access to proprietary research and insights again there are emerging trends and opportunities around the world so whether whether you want to you want to acquire a company uh or not uh, there, there's a lot of data and information out there and we try our best to 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 gather uh all the material information that's relevant to the transaction so that you are making your decisions eyes wide open uh again we are we collaborate with our clients uh understand their unique investment objectives risk tolerance and and through this collaboration it's really a partnership over a few months time where yes we we gather all the data you have and then you know we will we will really try to put together a very powerful story that maximizes um uh, the company's value our client's value right the the other aspect uh of maximizing uh, risk adjusted returns is the risk itself so this is another really really difficult area gentlemen ladies and gentlemen because um we understand what is risk that is the probability of loss right that is that is risk but you know if you peel the onion a little bit you see that you have operational risk which is extremely hard to quantify right um you have financial risk which is not so difficult to quantify given the value at risk frameworks and the earnings at risk frameworks cash flow at risk frameworks you can use uh with the um uh, uh all, all the techniques that are that are available uh, monte carlo simulation 
techniques. And, and so you're, you're able to get your arms around financial risk, right? You can put a number that, that given 5% probability. So for example, um, uh, cash flow at risk would give you a number that says over the next 12 months, given 95% probability, I can say that our loss, uh, it will not be more than X dollars. Or I can give you 99% probability assurance that your risk uh, exposure will not be more than X million dollars. You can actually put that number. But it is uh, almost impossible to do that regarding operational risk. And what is operational risk is your people risk and your process risk and your governance risk and your strategic, well, strategic risk is not really part of operational risk, but you know, some elements could be, but you know, it's, that's very difficult. Okay. So that's why I say that, that the, that the, the risk management aspect, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I was just, uh, having a discussion today with a client, uh, you know, uh, I'm in Vietnam right now. Uh, we have a, we have a, uh, biofuels client here and, um, we were actually discussing exactly this thing that the operational risk, how do we quantify, how do we put our arms around, uh, you know, you talk about fire safety, you talk about environment, health and safety. You can talk about, uh, you know, people risk, right? Um, you know, th th these are the issues, you know, quality management, quality risk, all those things. So we, we try, we try our best to bring in all the methodologies that are available uh, you know, best practices, methodologies to help our clients uh, uh, get, get our, get their hands around, get their arms around, uh, you know, what is actually their, uh, we try to help them quantify, right? Uh, quantify their risk exposure. So if, if I ask you guys a question, you know, all of you, you know, many of you here run companies. If you ask, if I ask you guys to give me a number, right? I, if I ask you, what's your revenue? You'll be able to give me a number. What was your profit last year? You'll be able to give me a number. But if I ask you, what was your risk exposure last year? You'll not be able to give me a number. If I ask you, what is your risk exposure today? You'll not be able to give me a number. See, that's the thing. And, and that's why I say that, that this is a very important area for further research. And uh, think about that. Think about how you can uh, you can address that. Okay, switching gears again. Uh, products and services. What what do we do again? We help you raise capital, debt capital, long term through bond issuance. We help you raise equity capital. You issue new equity. Your company issues new shares, and we will get you the investors uh, who uh, who will buy those shares, and uh, you get the money. With that money, you can raise the, you can make your expansion project, and then we can do a, a buyback, structured buyback option, uh, so that you can buy back those shares. Investors can exit after five years. Your company can go IPO, and uh, you buy those shares back if you have the money to do so. Interesting. Uh, all kinds of structures can be done. Primary market, secondary market, um, all those are possible if you're if you're issuing shares for the first time to the public primary offering. Uh, if you're an existing shareholder, right? Uh, maybe maybe your company is raising $100 million. You are a major shareholder. You actually want to sell some of your shares as part of the capital raise. You can always do that. That's a secondary market offering. And uh, that's fine, right? That's, that's uh, we call them sec uh, selling shareholders and you can raise capital that way. M&A advisory, mergers and acquisitions advisory, buy side, sell side. So you could be looking to buy a company, you could be looking to buy a smaller competitor and we'll help you do that deal to maybe a leverage buyout by taking some, some additional uh, loans, right? We, we can do sell side as well. If you want to sell your company or part of your company, uh, if it's more than 50% equity sale, it would be part of M&A. Uh, then you have deal structuring and uh, you know, that's, we can structure it in many different ways, uh, not getting to too, too much detail there. But um, investment bankers will definitely help you uh, optimize. They'll give you option one, option two, option three. What's the best way to do this, right? Uh, Spin-offs, split-offs, divestitures. If you want to sell part of your company, a division or a segment, you can do that. 
there this this is competition is increasing right and you're you you know one of the one of the things that companies are doing these days is they want to uh, they want to get rid of non uh, non core businesses right so once you've been able to figure out what's your core focus because as i said competition is increasing you can't lose focus the more diversified you are in terms of sectors the less focus you have so um, you know a lot lot of uh, companies uh, spin off their non core businesses all right uh, let's uh, go to a little bit more detail though. on the debt side we'll help you raise credit lines over 10 million term loans over 100 uh, debt placements uh, all kinds of structured products the financial accounting standards board conceptual framework we are following that as well equity side massive uh, we are connected to over 5000 banks right we are connected to over 40000 institutional investors private placements is what we do we we don't i mean regent financial right we we don't reach out to retail investors our network uh, and our work is with institutional that's why we do large scale we will do an enterprise valuation for you we will um you know as, as i said you know a convertible debt convertible equity those are possible earnouts are possible so let's say you want to raise you, you want to raise 20 million uh your investor is not willing to give you more than 15 uh you can come up with uh, earnout clause right you can you can say you you will earn 2 and 1/2 million each of the next 2 years that way you get your 20 million so those are all part of the structure exit planning special purpose acquisition companies uh, all those are possible we can help you get listed in nasdaq we can help you uh uh you know but primarily we do private placements okay that is uh, easy easier i should say because those are exempt transactions according to the securities uh, act uh, of uh uh securities act and securities exchange act and then um lots of strategic buyers you know there are a lot of financial buyers or investors there are a lot of strategic buyers so if, if you are looking to sell your company or part of your company you're trying to raise capital you can um you can get a strategic buyer who is in your own sector right they might be do interested to do a backward linkage or a forward linkage and your company might provide significant synergies uh, to their business right so there's strategic value and so if you sell to a strategic buyer you would typically be able to charge a premium if your company is worth 100 million we'd probably be able to get you 110 million or 125 million but uh, typically the premium is not more than 33% so you know but that's interesting strategic buyer is is typically willing to give you a premium not always but yeah so um so they always want accretion right so their earnings per share should after transaction after the consolidation uh, after they consolidate your company assuming you sell your company uh, their, their earnings per share should go higher not lower right and then the due diligence uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of you know, financial due diligence to make sure your your numbers are right uh, there is operational due diligence to make sure your operational um assertions are accurate right um and then there is legal due diligence to make sure um you know all the legal aspects are taken care of um post merger integration is another thing uh, this is this is a very key thing for the success of mna right um post merger once you acquire a company or you get acquired by a company uh that that the, there are two companies that are becoming one let's say if it's a merger and um or there's a third company that's created uh, in the case of a merger or you know maybe the target company is getting eliminated in the case of an acquisition yeah, you're you're definitely uh you'll definitely have to look at the two cultures and make sure that uh Uh, that they integrate well hmm? uh, advisory services again all kinds of advisory services one of the ones that i want to highlight here is special situations right what is special situations special situations is uh, like this uh, like a distressed company all right you you're having difficulty your cash flow is in trouble your earnings growth is 
is low, maybe post COVID or during COVID, you went through some financial challenges and you're in trouble. You, you have lack of working capital. You don't have the fund to grow. Uh, you know, your banks are after you, uh, these kind of situations. So special situations are mostly uh, distressed situations. And we, we do distressed situations and turn around advisory as well. We have investors for distressed companies, but don't expect to get paid dollar for dollar. You would get, they'd pay you 50 cents on the dollar. They'd pay you 25 cents on the dollar, but we'll try to help you maximize that. Valuations, fairness, opinions, all that. We definitely do all that. All right, so uh, let me just jump to mergers and acquisitions. I talked a lot about that. Uh, one of the things is the difference between merger and acquisition. I just highlighted uh, a merger is a situation where two companies combine to form a new company. So two companies, think about like two roads merging into one road, right? Two companies merging into one. Okay. In an acquisition, what's happening is one company is getting eliminated. Whereas in a merger, maybe a third company is getting created, right? In acquisition, one company is getting eliminated. The larger company typically will buy the smaller company and consolidate its operations. Uh, yeah, I mean, one thing is for sure that the mergers and acquisitions are always very complex, very complex transactions. A lot of things uh, that come into play. So, yeah, I mean, definitely you do not want to, as Dr. Hazaman mentioned, uh, you, like you don't want to get into a legal situation without a cert, uh, without a accredited, uh, certified, uh, approved lawyer. You certainly don't want to get into an M&A situation uh, without an investment banker. Okay. All right. So let me, uh, for the regulation, I won't get too deep. Just to say that in the United States, you have all kinds of regulations that we are subject to. There are federal regulations like the Securities Act 1933 and the 1934. We have Investment Advisors Act, uh, Investment Company Act. These are your mutual funds and your hedge funds and so on. Then Uniform Securities Act. This is the state law. We are subject to both state law and federal law. This Securities Act 1933 and 1934, these are federal laws. Uniform Securities Act, that's what we call USA. Uh, they, they, these are state laws. And then Sarbanes-Oxley, this is all about, you know, sort of uh, uh, financial uh, uh, discipline and disclosure and, uh, you know, making sure internal, there's adequate internal control and, and to make sure that the CEO and CFO are personally responsible, right, for... Um, for the accuracy of the financial statements. A uh, series 79 is something, it's, it's, a, it's a five hour long exam, <laughs> guys, that we have to pass in order to uh, be, be licensed as an investment banker. Not just series 79, we have to pass uh, three or four other exams, just like any other professional, uh, you know, doctors need that, uh, lawyers need that, we also need that. And um, if you don't have these licenses, you cannot raise capital. For example, think of it like this. If you are a CFO of a company and you, you want to go out there and raise capital for your company, you are not allowed to do that. SEC won't allow you to do that. In fact, you have to hire a licensed investment banker. Otherwise, you cannot go and raise capital. You cannot go and, and, and raise capital. All right. So, okay. So that's the regulation. Let's quickly touch on the top 10 trends. So I talked about ESG. You all know about that, that no need to uh, talk more about that shift towards global digitization, automation of processes. This is this is affecting us very significantly because we need to uh, you know, sort of transform our efficiency. Automate our processes, be faster, better, cheaper, faster, better. Um, expansion into emerging markets is a key trend. And uh, those of you who've looked at the global growth rates, you know, that uh, the uh, Asian region, right? The Asian Asia Pacific region is still going to dominate growth rates or significantly higher than Europe and North America um, and Africa. Okay, so the fastest growing region in the world will be emerging markets, in particular Asia. Of course, Africa is growing very fast as well, but you know, uh, there, there are, like we, we saw that there are, the capital market in Africa is significantly constrained. Integration of AI, machine learning, that's uh, that's a pretty amazing set of developments happening. Um, fintech is disrupting our industry, all right? A lot of disintermediation happening, crowdfunding, 
Bitcoin and all kinds of uh, financial apps are disintermediating our work. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe in 30 years time, you will not need uh, investment bankers like us anymore. <laughs> A lot of the portfolio management is now automated. And so, but I think guys, to be honest, uh, uh, you know, computers, uh, in my opinion, are not ready to replace humans just as yet. So, so you'll just use the need us for a few more years. Uh, greater emphasis, diversity, inclusion. Yeah, definitely. Uh, adoption of cloud-based technologies happening. Uh, this is not a new trend. This has been happening for decades now. Uh, cybersecurity risk management is a key thing. Um, increased regulatory scrutiny. That's one thing that's that's affecting our industry globally. Uh, you know, you, you heard about all the financial uh, uh, turmoil uh, and all those things. So uh, that was uh, that was a key aspect that increased uh, that required the increase of regulatory scrutiny around the world and uh, the key there is the Basel three you know um, and 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 now they're saying that the 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 sort of the liquidity requirements of Basel three is not sufficient right so um, interesting that you could expect as, at least in the banking sector uh, the, the 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 capital requirements uh, tier one tier two capital requirements for banks is going to be increased. And for uh, us investment banks, we also have a capital requirement. It's called net capital requirement in the US. And so we would expect our capital requirements to go up as well. All right, and greater collaboration um, between investment banks and other financial institutions to provide end-to-end -end solutions. Yeah, that's, that's something that is certainly happening. And we are collaborating, like I said, uh, we uh, we have over five thousand banks uh, globally that we we that's in our network, and we do syndicated financing and capital raise all the time. All right, guys, I'm sorry I took longer than I, uh, I planned to, but uh, let me open it up for questions. Uh, please, uh, let's let's start with the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Asaf, and. Uh... It has been a great uh, session for sure. And we can see some of our friends are ready to raise question. Um, our uh, background uh, administrator, please uh, allow them to um, speak, uh, unmute them. Uh, Mr. Rismond, uh, looking for uh, uh, a question. So go ahead with the question, please. Um, thanks, um, Doc. Um, and um, I must say that this, um, you know, presentation, you know, is, is has been quite, you know, extensive, and um, you know, it goes a long way to, you know, um, improve and of course enhance our understanding. Now, uh, just just a little, you know, elaboration. I mean, Doc mentioned talked about top ten trends in investment banking, and for me, one of the things that caught my um, attention has to do with the integration of um, AI and machine learning. Now, my question is, you know, how is this area, you know, transforming the la landscape of investment banking and what opportunities and challenges does this present to the business environment? Thank you. Thanks, Richmond. Uh, great question. Uh, we see uh, machine learning and AI come in various forms, shapes and sizes, right? So we oh, first thing is that there are, there are new apps coming out every other day that can do this and can do that and uh, those were never possible before so uh, you know we, we, we you know let's say risk management all right we uh, investment banks used to have massive uh, departments of analysts who would be charged with analyzing terabytes of data using you know uh, econometric uh, softwares, right? Trend analysis forecasts. Now that work can be automated. So terabytes of data don't need to be manually analyzed anymore. So you have these softwares that are powered by AI and machine learning, and you can program them to take that data set, analyze it, uh, and g give us the, uh, Give us the, uh, you know, say, for example, let's say identifying credit risk. 
it'll automatically identify the the uh, uh, clients that um, are, rep- uh, are presenting a higher credit risk. So one of the, uh, I'll say, I don't know whether you call it a uh, negative or positive, but uh, we don't need as many people anymore. So the work that used to be done by a team of 20 now needs a team of two, three. So the question obviously becomes, and by the way, uh, Richard, there are many examples similar to this. You know, you go department by trading, for example. I, I talked to you about research. Same thing. The machine learning algorithms now with generative AI, it allows you to research much faster. It allows you to do credit analysis much faster. Uh, when you talk about forecasting, for example, when, when we were in school, we used to learn, you know, autoregressive integrated moving averages, right? Arimas and, and Sarimas and the advanced econometric techniques. Now, you know, we, we used to learn, you know, five different techniques and then forecast using all the different techniques and then do back testing and all that and then figure out which forecasting technique is the best. Only to realize that there was a regime change in the data and now this particular technique that we thought was the best to, to predict is no longer the best technique because regime has changed. Yeah, so there's all that kind of there, you know, uh, uh, things that we, we, it was very difficult to stay on top of the game because we would do this manually. Now, the machine learning algorithms will not evaluate five different kinds of forecasting techniques. It will evaluate 5,000 types of forecasting techniques in a split second and automatically detect regime change. So, I mean, the forecasts have become so much more accurate and it's all automatic. So on the one hand, you could think of this as cost cost reduction uh, because it's automated. On the other hand, the negative is it's a black box. Often it's a black box because you, you can't often explain why it's happening. Why it's recommending this or that, there's nobody to explain it. It's hard to explain. These machine learning algorithms often use um, techniques that uh, are neural network driven, and it's just very hard. So um, it is impacting, to summarize, this AI and machine learning is impacting our business. Uh, It's making us more efficient and more productive. It's making us faster. And the people who are being relieved of their duties We don't want to fire them, so we are putting them to work uh, on more strategic aspects of things. So it's a very, it's a bit of a stretch and a bit of a uh, arrogant remark on my part, I should say, and apologies for that. But I think I could, I can claim that the investment banking industry, the financial service industry, all the industries around the world in every country, the result of AI and machine learning is we are going to become as humanity more strategic because all the menial tasks right is being taken over by the by, and becoming becoming automated so what are we going to do are we firing 80 percent of our employees no we are becoming more strategic so that's what we are doing with our people and i think you will see that um we are more productive we are faster we are better more strategic we are uh, going to be delivering greater value faster and it's all good it's it's i think uh it's it's not going to be a threat to us i think it's going to be good for for our our productivity and uh, uh quality of service i hope i answered your question very well thank you you're welcome hello may, may i put my question across please Welcome. <laughs> My name is Tony Sowa from Ghana, Africa. Um, Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it's insightful. Um, the data you presented on you know, global capital markets and uh, regional share across mm-hmm. different continents is very telling. Mm-hmm. And I just, want, I just wonder why Africa is, is lagging so far behind um, the other continents. There, there, there is no shortage of opportunities in, 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 in Africa. 
and and there's no shortage of desire to um cooperate or you know partner um you know people like you across the atlantic and and, and across the gulf to um ex explore opportunities emerging industry industries in africa so mm -hmm. from your experience as a, a professional an expert in this area especially operating from the most advanced market in the u.s what mm -hmm. what do you think accounts for this phenomenon of africa africa's market um always lagging behind in in this area given that there is there is no sh uh, shortage of opportunities in africa yeah that's uh, that's such a great question i i wish i could give you a satisfactory answer but unfortunately my my knowledge uh is very limited uh in this uh i i i'm afraid i i really don't i don't know the right answer why it is um but i will still let, let me you know uh indulge me just a little bit uh i i think it's not a negative a story in itself in the sense that i expect fully that uh you know africa would be the fastest growing region in the world in the coming decade and the capital markets uh, a lot of that is driven by uh, sort of um, you know when when just think about it like this uh, when does a person invest in the stock market right if if i if i'm earning um uh, if my earnings are are you know not very high let's say uh, i earn 100 bucks i spend 99 bucks for, on my family i'm not really saving a whole lot right in that case uh, i i you know whatever little savings i have i have it in my bank uh, am i investing in the stock market probably not okay and and so the equity market doesn't grow if the the wealth level of the individuals doesn't allow them to save so if you think of it from a macroeconomic perspective uh, the wealth of a nation is really the wealth of individuals that you aggregate right and um maybe i would venture to say that as africa becomes um richer and more you know uh prosperous you will see the savings rates go up and as the savings rates go up uh i'm saying average population right as the savings rates go up you will naturally see more and more investments happening in the stock market more and more companies issuing shares initially you will see the equity market growing bigger and bigger so that's where you'll see tremendous growth in your equity markets and only after that you will see the bond markets develop if this is not something you know if you if you think about the government right your know, government cannot force the capital market to grow you can give incentives for people to save, but you can't force companies to come to the capital market. So Africa most likely is dependent on the banking sector to raise capital. So if a company needs to raise, if a company needs to grow, it goes to the bank and says, hey, I need to raise capital. The other way in which you can support capital raise is through foreign direct investment. So you have the 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 balance of payments right so you have the cap current account and the capital account and so uh, you know your capital account is the inflow of your foreign direct investment and so you have to ask your question you go country by country in africa and see what amount of fdi is coming in and fdi in your country is a function of the business climate how friendly is your country? What is the legal? So what is the level of sophistication of the legal environment, um, the regulatory environment? The, how business friendly is it? What is the level of corruption? What is the level of political stability? What is the sovereign credit rating? Are you a investment grade economy? There's, there's a lot of elements that, you know, economies need to mature before you see your capital market becoming a huge part uh, you know, maybe uh, size of the capital market bigger than your GDP. 
definitely possible so i fully expect asia uh, africa to be the fastest growing capital market but uh, i'm unfortunately i don't know if if my assumption about savings rate low savings rate and <coughs> excuse me um maybe maybe that is driving um the small size of your capital market um or um and or there could be um you know the, the fact that maybe your government policies are not uh, adequately supportive of a vibrant capital market so maybe you need to look at your industrial policy you need to look at uh, maybe privatization you may need to look at growing your capital market through all kinds of incentives for example A lot of governments lower the tax rates for publicly listed companies that thereby giving them an incentive to get listed right um so so those are some of the i would say policy measures uh you know so fdi promote your fdi get more companies to invest more uh company more uh, foreign investment to come into your country so you know if you're looking at you know if you if if you want you know uh we we a uh, region financial can help bring in billions of dollars into your country but uh will we uh, be able to do that uh, well we can do that you you uh, there has to be good companies with good project there has to be the enabling environment uh in your country where a group of investors would be willing to put in a billion dollars there needs to be transparency there needs to be continuity uh, of of policy and all those things so uh, i think it is it is a really big challenge um and the fact that the numbers are really really small suggests that you need to take a whole of government approach that is fiscal policy monetary policy yes traveling, traveling to more than 42 african countries among the 54 and spending more than 3 decades in africa deep inside including your country where i had been to at least uh, 20 times in uh, uh, ghana well the yes um, there are um, extreme potential in africa for sure but uh, at the same time in addition to what dr asaf said that about the government uh, need to take the initiative but at the same time those who you are in the private sector you you guys also need to take serious initiative as well and there i can see a a need a gap is remaining all the times because the knowledge gap the fear you know the africans are in in the fear and then what you say you need to do that like i met uh, three or four of your ministers last year including yofi grant from uh, gipc in toronto i think they spent a lot of money there were 400 people in the uh, ballroom of sheraton and two days program massive eating fooding and all those but i don't know how much money they could uh, harvest from that event but i have been trying to reach out to all of them the tourism minister the minister of information and uh, communication the minister of uh, another minister and i i think i visited him personally as well you know about this and um, number of other uh, agencies but for last one year like I spent so much of time but nothing came up but i can see gipc and ghanian government going here and there including in the southern america in jamaica in london in here and there everywhere you are uh, ghana is everywhere but what is the outcome what is the harvest you are getting in terms of your for fdi inflow that you need to also look at seriously so there probably there's you know you need to see what are the missing links there are definitely missing links you know you can have two kind of like your generals probably are running at a 100 km speed but the rest of the soldiers are probably running at a speed of 20 km so it's a gap you know 
So it's not happening. So the soldiers probably need to run at 90 km speed. And also there are a lot of knowledge gap. What you are getting here today at no cost from Dr. Asab, from Dr. Haider and others, this you need to get regularly and frequently and more and more, but by paying a premium price. And most of the African countries, when they hear knowledge to be bought, oh no, that's a big problem. That's a negative issues. Like the way the Singapore grew, what is there? What is the behind back, background? There is not one gallon of water in Singapore produced. Every single drop of water coming from Malaysia. There is not even one drop of oil, not one piece of sand they can utilize. Having everything in Africa, having all kinds of resources in Africa, even your country where you are talking about this, Ghana is the largest cocoa producing country in the world. Ghana is one of the top five gold producing country in the world. Ghana is one of the top oil producing country in the world. Ghana is having gas. Ghana is having agriculture. Ghana is having anything and everything. What is the shortest here? So I'm sorry, I, I give a little bit of an aggressive commentary, but as I love uh, Africa and I love Ghana as well. So I think this is something, it's a, it's, it's a waking, waking up call for you guys in, in Africa in general. It's time you wake up fast and grow in, 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 and just take actions. It's, we can keep talking, but it will not help. You need to take action and that effective actions. And if taking effective actions, you need partners, you need friends, you need associates, you need experts. How Dubai grew, just study a little bit on that. Did they have all these brains? No. Do they have the brains today? No, they are inviting all top brainers from all around the world. How the Saudi is growing now, I can see they will grow real time big because MBS is now inviting every everyone from this whole world, all the brilliant ones that come and invest and come and spend your time. We will take care of you. We'll give you the best. Think about that. So this is the environment we are talking about. This is the environment Dr. Asaf talked about. I'm sorry, I'm taking a little bit more time. We have one more speaker, but we have question. I can see some uh, of our friends are still asking question. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. I hope that we could answer your question, uh, Mr. Sawa. And uh, you are a very young leader in uh, Ghana and I look forward to work with you closely to transform your country, transform your company, transform yourself and transform your colleagues all around. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Any more questions? Someone wanted to ask a question, I guess. Okay, maybe he is no more here. So any question, please feel free. Um, Dr. Asaf will be pleased to answer. And um, also just now I'd like to invite all of you, those who are here in um, our summit, in-person summit in Lisbon. We'll be having an in-person summit in Lisbon on the 15th of February, um, where we will be um, meeting and discussing about your project that you have ready to go where you need funding. Uh, there will be more interesting uh, uh, way to get your funding done. You will be meeting um, the investors like Dr. Asaf on the board, on, on site, and um, you can discuss with him one-to-one -one and uh, get your solutions uh, done in a stantly. Some of them, you, 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 you know, will, will get in a stand solutions if you're doing some homework from right now, from um, right few months back, uh, behind, I mean, right away. So that's um, uh, the summit that we have in, um, in um, uh, Portugal, in Lisbon on the 15th of February, early next year. So those who would like to join, please let us know. We are already running out of the um, seats. Uh, we have limited 100 uh, 
uh, top entrepreneurs and uh, uh, investors coming from all around the world. So this will be an event that you can um, always um, enjoy and uh, get your financial solutions done the way we do, do, do it today. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, now we have, uh, thank you, Dr. Asaf. Uh, you have your last word about um, uh, your presentation. We thank you so much for taking the time and uh, making it happen, though you are traveling at the moment to Vietnam and uh, we appreciate your kind uh, presence here. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. We look forward to hear again from you. It's a great knowledge that you are exhorting for the world. We are very proud of you. We are real proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We have uh, our uh, friend uh, Oksana uh, Shetenko from uh, Switzerland. Uh, she has a summit in the front and uh, she's one of our partner and uh, uh, and, and uh, giving us um, a lot of uh, uh, supports and uh, we are supporting her. So we'd like to hear from um, Oksana. She represents a company called Alliance 100 from 110, uh, from UK. And um, Oksana would be um, talking about her program, what she does and uh, how she helps uh, businesses. Please uh, welcome Oksana uh, here. Oksana, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, uh, please uh, join yes, the- Thank uh, you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Haider. It's a pleasure to see you as always. And um, thank you everyone to participate in this uh, online event. So I would like to tell a little bit more about myself. I am one of the co-founders of company Allianz 110. We are based in the UK in London and uh, mainly nowadays we uh, make and business events in Switzerland. And what we actually are doing, so we help uh, companies to raise the capital and mainly we are working like in different spheres, like in real estate, in uh, companies who are working connected with AI technologies, with blockchain, Web3, the five projects. Uh, also nowadays, it's um, a huge demand for, from a lot of mainly private investors and family offices from Switzerland to companies who are related to wireless power, because nowadays uh, it's really like quite interesting topic. And what I would like, uh, uh, because I was uh, listening regarding this presentation and um, it was really, uh, you know, uh, interesting to hear about and I would like to add that for sure, if you have a really good project, it's every time better to connect with investor bank, banking and uh, yeah, that they can uh, help you, you know, to make a good combination between your project and investor. Because uh, what we see nowadays, a lot of companies try to reach us and ask uh, to help them to raise the capital. But without a good background and uh, making like some financial focus and more uh, information about the company, you we can't introduce uh, um, these companies for investors. As mainly every uh, like uh, venture fund, private investor or family office, they will require a lot of information. And if you can't provide this, unfortunately, you can't also raise the capital. So for this reason, I uh, pretty agree. Uh, with uh, this presentation and uh, I would like really to give a good like sense for this explanation for all of you that it's really very important to make um, like this uh, cooperation and work with private bankers because as I told you it will help you to raise the capital much faster than you will try to reach by yourself um, like some small investments and so on. So uh, as uh, Dr. Heide already mentioned like we also will make uh, one business event. It will be 26th of October in Zurich in Switzerland. And there also will be participated some like private investors, family offices mainly, which are based in Switzerland. So we'll be glad to invite you. And as I have today, like some a little bit short time, you know, so I would like to tell thank you everyone who participated in this event. Uh, also, Dr. Heidi, thank you for invitation. And uh, yeah, thank you all and wishing the great weekend. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Oksana, and um, I wish your uh, event to be very successful on the 26th. And I look forward to seeing you in Zurich. And um, we'll be talking to the um, uh, participant there. And um, we meet them, talk to them, and uh, see how we can help them. Um, I think I'm a speaker there, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll be looking forward to see you again. Um, we met a few days back, last 10 days back. I think I was in Zurich. Uh, very. On a, on, a, on a very short trip. So I look forward to uh, see you uh, on the 26th and uh, speaking to your participants and see how we can align more to cooperate and help our friends all around the world as we have been helping. I thank you so much for making the time and look forward to see you on 26th. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, the uh, any questions so far to Oksana or to us um, um, uh, on on this uh, Zurich summit um, or uh, a Lisbon summit or any uh, question about uh, uh, Dr. Samir's uh, presentation? Please feel free to send us an email or send us a text. We will be very glad to uh, furnish the information and uh, assist you on that and. Um, Anything that uh, you need to know, please feel free to send us an email. We'll uh, be very glad to um, help you out. Well, now the um, big thing is uh, the summit uh, on, uh, in Lisbon. Um, we are very excited and we can see a lot of uh, excitement among our uh, participants as well, because so far we have received uh, confirmation from 40 over countries, our uh, friends and uh, partners are coming to Lisbon. It's a fantastic city and uh, also the business, you know, post COVID, everything is really um, exciting to have a in-person meeting and have a coffee, have a lunch, have a dinner, discuss business and, and, and close deals. This is what is needed. So, and we will be doing that. Um, we will be again uh, meeting on the 4th of November on our monthly webinar, as usual, the first Saturday of the month. And first Saturday in November is on the 4th of November, same time, same time, June. So you can um, adjust your clock and you can already put it in your Google Calendar um, on the 4th of November, same time, but we'll be having some exciting news and by the time those who um, had um, have uh, attended today and learned things about this investment banking i i'm sure that you could consume these and uh, have more questions we will be very pleased to answer your question and uh, also uh, get you more insight from uh, investment banking and other um, the FDI foreign direct investment possibilities and um, merger and acquisitions and all uh, on the 4th of November. I look forward to see you and till that time, you are stay safe and uh, stay blessed. And uh, thank you once again for joining. Congratulations. Take care. Thank you, Doc. You're welcome. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Doc. I came in late, Hello. but I got a little bit of it. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Oh, my, my uh, friend, the Excellency Minister of Finance of Gambia, here. I'm sorry, I, I yes. missed you, my brother. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I didn't see yes, you. Yes, I came in late. Place. I came in late. But on the November 4th, I'll be there too. I'll be there. I'll take on it. Thank you, Excellency, uh, for joining. And uh, okay. you are a great inspiration. You are also a great son of the soil of the world, I would say. You are a global citizen. You are a global uh, resources. So we would look forward to hear from you. you. So you kindly create some time on the 4th of November. We, I would like to really hear from Thank you. you. You are a scholar. So I look forward to see, see you on okay. the 4th of November and hear from you, sir. Okay. Thank okay, you. take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.